Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today, we speak with two influential women in the world of entertainment. Our first guest is best known for her role as an angel named Monica in the beloved television series Touched by an Angel. Roma Downey has earned multiple Emmy and Golden Globe nominations as an actress and producer. Downey, along with her husband, Mark Burnett, produced the Emmy-nominated miniseries The Bible for the History Channel, which was watched by over 100 million people in the U.S. alone. Downey continues to pursue her passion of bringing the gospel to the world through the medium of television and film, and now has a new online community full of inspirational and uplifting resources called Lightworkers.com. Hello, I'm Roma Downey, and um, I was born and raised in Derry City in Northern Ireland, and I immigrated to the United States about 25 years ago now, and I came over with a dream in my heart to be an actress, and um, I had a really blessed um, career. I grew up in a house full of faith, and my um, uh, mother had passed away when I was just a little girl. Um, I was uh, just a week shy of my 11th birthday, and my mother died very unexpectedly of a heart attack. And to say that it changed my life would be an understatement. It was as if my life had been in full color until that point, and then suddenly it went into black and white. She had just been the joy in our home. She was the warm fire in the cold hearth. I mean, any of those metaphors could have described the loss was so was so extreme and painful. And I don't know if it hadn't been for her, our faith and the fact that we as a family were able to lean into our faith and found the comfort in our faith and hope in our faith. I grew, I grew up in a house where it was always the right time for a prayer. And I honestly can say that throughout the journey of my life, uh, I've never made any decision, big or small, that I didn't approach prayerfully. One of my very first jobs before I got any acting work or had any success as an actor, I was just a young girl with a dream, an Irish girl in New York City. And one of my first jobs was as a coat check girl. I was checking coats in a very fancy restaurant on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. And I remember one of the very first celebrities I ever met was Regis Philbin. And he came in and checked his coat. And at that time, he and Kathy Lee had the Regis and Kathy Lee show together. I remember he checked his coat. And normally, I might have gotten a quarter or a dollar a coat, you know, if I was lucky. And Regis gave me $20. And I thought I had died and went to heaven. And then just five years later, I was starring on Touched by an Angel. That could only happen in America. I'm certain of it, that you could be a starving coat check girl one day and you could be the star of a TV show the next day. But anyway, wasn't I invited on to the uh, Regis uh, and Kathy's show? And, um, and I got to tell him that story. And he laughed and he said, you're only telling me the story for two reasons. He said, either I stiffed you or I was generous. And I said, well, I'd never come on your show and tell a bad story about you. A kindness always comes around. Kathy Lee, as you know, is a dear friend of mine. And I've known her now for many years. She guest starred uh, way back when on Touched by an Angel. And that was such a, a pleasure for me to get to work with her as a, you know, as a fellow actress and a pleasure for me to get to know her as a strong woman of faith. For many years, I had the privilege of playing an angel on a CBS television show called Touched by an Angel. Um, I played the character of Monica. And every week, I got to deliver a most important and joyful message, and that is that there is a God, that He loves us, and that He wants to be part of our lives. I think that I had learned from having experienced deep and profound loss at such a young age. And I was able to use it, I think, in playing the angel, because um, a lot of uh, Monica's role, untouched by an angel, was listening, listening not just with her ears, but listening with her heart and really trying to understand what it is that the person might be going through. 
And unlike any television show I'd ever been on before, we would pray. We would hold hands and we would we would pray that the Holy Spirit would um, would come through us, would come through me, and would would minister to anybody watching whose heart was hurting in any way. And so my prayer became less of me, more of you. And it's a prayer that I, um, you know, that I utter in all the work that I do to this day because, you know, it, it was never about me or Delores or John Dye or any of the actors who were on the show with me. One of the greatest and most lasting gifts of being untouched by an angel was my uh, beautiful relationship with my co-star, the wonderful Della Reese. Uh, Della, for anybody that's ever met her, people will know that she doesn't, she's not a handshaker, she's a hugger. <laughs> and I remember when I first met her on the set, um, uh, I came into the hair and makeup trailer, she was sitting, um, uh, getting ready for that first scene. And she, she's you know got a big personality and a big smile and a big heart and i came in and you know and politely put up my hand to shake her hand to introduce her and she stood up <laughs> and she stood up and she's much taller than i am and she stood up and she threw her arms open wide and she said baby i don't shake hands i'm a hugger and she wrapped me in her loving embrace and I can tell you um, from all experience, there's no safer place in the world than in the arms of Della Reese. And the relationship that you saw on screen and touched by an angel was reflected very much by the relationship that we had off screen. Um, she has been such a wise mentor to me, a teacher, a funny, feisty guider. She's, you know, just been a joy in my life and and she and I share something very special because as I mentioned to you my mum had died when I was a little girl and so in many ways I was grew into a woman who has just always been looking for that relationship you know I've missed my mother all these years there's not a day goes by I don't think of my mother but Della came into my life with such a maternal and loving um, warmth and energy and she really you know took that place and when I was working with Della her only daughter tragically passed away and um, months later when we were walking together in quiet reflection she took my hand and she said you know baby God is just amazing because I always knew that he brought me into your life because you needed a mother I just didn't realize, she said, that that he brought you into my life because I was going to meet a baby girl. She said, will you be my baby? I said, yes, and she said, I am your mama. And so from that day, she has been a mother to me and I have been a daughter to her. And, you know, that's just such evidence of God's goodness. Because, of course, each of us still longs for, you know, she for her daughter and I for my mom. But we've been able to provide comfort and love and, and fill some of that need in each other. And that's, you know, as Della would say, that's a God thing that we were able to do that and be there for each other. And even though the show has been off the air, uh, for many years now, uh, my relationship with Della has endured. I saw her just a few weeks ago. We continue to be very present and very much a part of each other's lives. And it was very special to, to be part of that. It was such a beautiful show and a beautiful job to be able to take home at the end of each day. Um, I, I learned so much, I think, from being on the show and it's, uh, playing Monica um, was such a, a gift for me We and, and my crew and we became such a family. We worked together for almost 10 years and we all loved each other dearly, but I think we were collectively all aware that we were part of something 
that was considerably larger than all of us. I know that um, that my experience in um, the industry of show business um, with regards to faith has been an interesting one. From the early days of Touch by an Angel, I attended several um, events down in, in uh, Los Angeles. On Touch by an Angel, we filmed out of state. We filmed in Utah. Uh, we were there because it was less expensive for, for our production company to make the series there. But consequently, we were a little bit um, like the country cousins. We weren't uh, living and shooting in Hollywood. And so when we came in for events, um, we were the out-of-towners. I remember once being at an event at, at the Parent Network at CBS, and one of the executives from the network, uh, in a rather whispered voice, said that uh, she'd caught an episode of Touched by an Angel last week. And it was very moving. And I said, why are we whispering? Why are we whispering? It's the number one show on CBS. There's an audience of over 20 million people. And yet we're whispering as if there's something to be embarrassed about or ashamed of. I think that, um, you know, we've seen that over and over that, that perhaps in our industry, if it's telling a story of faith, it's not cool or, it, you know, it's not going to be appealing to the masses. And yet I think that some of the shows that we've done that have had extraordinary ratings show that there is such a hunger for these stories, that people are always hungry for God. I've uh, gone on in my career to not just continue to be an actress, but to work as a producer and to work as a writer. So um, in my producing life, um, I teamed up with my husband, Mark Burnett, and together we produced a television series for the History Channel called The Bible. The Bible series played over six weeks and um, captured an audience of over a hundred million people collectively tuned in again to hear the Word of God and to, and to experience the Gospel um, as half the series was, um, was about the narrative of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Believe me, it was scary to tackle the Bible to do it in such a way that would be that would still remain true to the spirit of the book that would be um, you know the biggest challenge probably in the in the creation of the Bible series was selecting which stories were going to be in and which stories you know because we didn't have time obviously to do all of the stories and that took you know prayerful reflection uh, we also worked with a team of consultants, pastors, and influencers to make sure that when we, you know, were telling these stories, that we were doing so accurately, um, remembering who we were dealing with, with the Bible, and not adapting, a, you know, some fictional novel. Um, so we took the, the the job very, very seriously. But at the time we um, were going out to pitch it, we had a number of friends and colleagues. Who, um, who were concerned for us that either we would be subject to a great deal of criticism or ridicule or both, um, that you know, other people thought that no one would be interested in seeing the Bible brought to the, to the television screen, that you know, that we would be, um, you know, that it would not be successful, that an audience would not show up. And, you know, there were times when we also probably felt fearful around those very issues. And yet we felt the call that had started as a whisper in our hearts get louder and louder. And I think that here was the value that there was also two of us, you know, two stronger than one. We're, we're good partners, my husband and I. We're good friends, as well as being a husband and wife team. Where we have a really good understanding and we bring very different skills. We have quite different temperaments. And so I think that it was the combination of our team. You know, sometimes 
a door needs to be, uh, you know, opened, you know, with a bang. And there's no better man to kick a door down when needed than my husband. Um, and sometimes the door needs to be knocked on gently and, um, you know, and I have a different approach and together we got the job done. We gathered a incredible writing staff and crew and then a cast, um, a beautiful cast and it all came together so well. Roma has continued to be influential in the areas of faith and entertainment and was named by Variety Magazine as one of the 100 most powerful women in Hollywood. She continues to pursue her passion of telling stories of faith with a new online community called lightworkers.com. She talks about how she came to create this hub for uplifting and empowering resources and how books like Jesus Calling inspire her each day to bring the good news of the gospel to people everywhere. Lightworkers is a um, has been a um, a passion of mine for some time. Inspired really by a number of things, you know. I I I've lain in bed with my husband some evenings, and we're channel surfing just to relax at the end of the day. And inevitably, Mark will will find the news and start watching the news and. You know, repeatedly I said, I don't think I can go to sleep watching the news. It's just, there's so much heartache in the world. And it created such anxiety in me. Uh, and I said almost um, tongue-in-cheek, I wish someone would start the Good News channel. And um, and so I think that was sort of the this, this seed sown that I was wanting something that could celebrate all that is good in our world, because if you turned on the news, half the time you'd think that there are there are only bad things happening, but there are also good people doing good things everywhere, and that's what I wanted to celebrate with this short stories, two to five minutes, a positive and uplifting and encouraging content um, that we are hoping will will. You know, will light up your day. There's a, a, a saying that I've heard that I that I really responded to that says, "It's better to light a candle than curse the darkness." Better to light a candle than curse the darkness. So it's better to celebrate the good than to, you know, than to bemoan everything that's going wrong in our world. These stories of, uh, you know, that are heartwarming, that are hope that you know that just remind us that there are you know that there's goodness everywhere and that we need to make more noise about the good guys you know we just have to um our, our, one of my favorite quotes is mr rogers who he used to say when bad stuff happened his mother always said to him you know bad things will happen but look for the helpers there are always helpers at lightworkers.com, we want to celebrate the helpers. We want to tell those stories. We want to just, you know, encourage people. I always say, love is a verb. You know, it's easy to say, I love you, or it's easy to say, I love the Lord. But let it show up in your actions. Let you be kind, that you be thoughtful, that you be conscious, that you be generous. And, um, and in these small ways, when we all come together, uh, we, you know, I believe that then collectively we really can make a difference. And I think that we need to be, you know, that we need to be heard. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to Jesus Calling. Now, I read my Jesus Calling every day. I have the app on my phone. And so that makes it very convenient, particularly if I'm traveling. And um, it's... Uh, you know, I just, I just have so loved it, and um, I just, I love how um, Sarah Young has written the, 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 the style of the writing. It just brings me, it it creates such a personal and intimate um, point of engagement for me with um, with scripture and with the word for that day, and I always leave feeling enriched and feeling very loved 
I'm very comforted and very encouraged. So I try to make it part of my morning routine um, so that I can take that with me uh, through the day. But I love what Jesus Calling does. My husband also is a Jesus Calling uh, devotional fan. He starts his day with Jesus Calling. And even though you supply um, the, the scriptures for that morning on there, he loves to sit with his Bible and go to the, uh, to the scripture in the Bible. And he doesn't just read the quote. He likes to read the paragraph around it. So uh, he makes it part of his is really deep, deep, deeply in the word in the morning. So it's been such a blessing to each of us, and um, and we're grateful. I just like to share. I've been, you know, I've been reading. Obviously, reading scripture. I read about my Bible every day. But you know, I've been looking recently at scripture that's sort of in support that would be in support of my team as we move forward at Lightworkers. And um, I came across in Ephesians. The um, four to nine. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So I know that's what you guys are doing with Jesus Calling. That's what we are um, hoping and intending and praying to do at Lightworkers.com, and and I share that with your listeners because. Uh, that's something we can all do. So, you know, whatever you're doing, do it and do it with love and shine your light and, and keep praying. Let's pray for each other. Let's be supportive of each other um, and, uh, and try to raise each other up. To find out more and to be a part of Roma's new online community, please visit lightworkers.com. We'll have more of the Jesus Calling podcast with our next guest, actress, writer, and co-owner of Pure Flix Films, Andrea Logan White, right after this message from Audible. As a special offering to you, the listeners of the Jesus Calling podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Find your favorite Sarah Young titles, including Jesus Calling and Jesus Always, in an audiobook version, and get it for free by trying audible.com. Check out a small sample of the Jesus Calling audiobook featured at the end of this podcast. To download an entire free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling for your full free audiobook. Now, on to the second half of our show. Andrea Logan White is a wife, mother, actress, producer, writer, and speaker. Andrea has walked through the discouraging valleys, including a life-threatening battle with an eating disorder, and emerged with an enduring passion to encourage women who experience similar anxieties with body image struggles and weight issues in particular. In her new book, Perfectly Unfinished, Finding Beauty in the Midst of Brokenness, Andrea shares her story of giving up the Hollywood ideal of perfection and finding her worth from the perfect one that lives inside of her, Christ himself. I'm Andrea Logan White, and I'm an actress, author, co-owner of Pure Flix Entertainment. So uh, David and I, my husband, uh, we are part owners of a company that produces and distributes faith and family content. So TV, films, theatricals, um, we do a little bit of everything and we're in the, the, the business of making films and projects and content that inspires the human spirit and brings redemption and hope to other people and hopefully leads them to a greater understanding of who Christ is. I'm from Burlington, Illinois. I always say Chicago because nobody really has heard of Burlington. It's a small town in Northern Illinois and it's, you know, farm town. So I was born and raised in a, in a very small town. My grandparents still live there. Two brothers, so I have an older brother and a younger brother. My um, parents divorced when I was 12, 13. So growing up in a home that didn't have, first of all, a foundation of Christ, um, second of all, in a, in a dysfunctional home. And what really kept us forward focused at the time without having the Lord was sports. So we were all huge athletes. And, um, you know, from little on, I was in soccer and softball and, and played club volleyball in high school. So that was kind of my saving grace. It was 
like the cool people were in sports. It wasn't cool to be an actor. So if you were in theater or the drama program, you were kind of like the nerd. I just remember having really low self-esteem and being a sensitive person and growing up with no foundation of the Lord, low self-esteem, kind of being the sickly kid. I was the one who, if I was teased, you know, my brothers would call me Bucky Beaver and Brace Face. I was the lucky one who got braces and glasses. I was the nerdy one. I just was, and I didn't have confidence. And and um, and so that spawned, spun into puberty and experimenting with drugs from a young age mm -hmm. because my parents were divorced. My dad was kind of off working. My mom was... Uh, got into dating and I just remember feeling like, oh my gosh, I feel more mature than than I should and kind of having to be self-sufficient. Um, went to church on Christmas and Easter. My grandparents were incredible. Um, I lost my dad's grandparents when I was, same time my parents divorced. So I had the loss of both grand grandparents and a divorce of my parents. And so it was like, whoa, what's going on? Some major brokenness and emptiness and um, in that, gradually progressed into an eating disorder my senior year in high school and my mom told me she was going to move away and marry uh, my then stepdad and so I had this crazy amount of abandonment and emptiness and trying to figure out how to how to navigate life really by being my own parent so I, I parented myself and kind of took my younger brother under my wings and that that went with a lot of drugs and a lot of um, a lot of sin let's put it that way after I graduated, I got all the way down to 78 pounds. So I was a walking skeleton. This was after I'd graduated high school. And I remember graduating high school thinking, I have no vision for my life, I'm dying. And I was, I was dying. And, and, and the eating disorder was a form of controlling my environment because I couldn't control abandonment. My first love, the divorce of my parents, um, friends that were jealous, you know, all these relational issues that I just went, I shut down and, and slowly started to um, die inside, which manifested externally through the anorexia. And no matter what I did, wasn't good enough. And when you don't get affirmed by anybody, you believe those voices, especially when you don't know the voice of God. Thankfully, I moved to San Diego with my dad right after high school and um, spent four to six months in bed, did a little bit of outpatient therapy with the with the eating disorders, but I was 18 and I don't know what it, insurance is like now, but they considered it a mental illness and so insurance wouldn't cover it. And I kind of launched into that, um, the whole move to California, which was invigorating in a way and it got me strong enough to get out of bed to go to junior college. And that's where I fell in love with acting. I fell in love with a theater class, but it was kind of cool because I got to create a new identity when I moved to San Diego. I didn't know anybody. I was very shy growing up, but yet I, I hid under sports and I got to create myself all over again. Got an agent and did a little bit of um, auditioning down there, but I got to discover myself in a new way. And I found that acting, I got to cover myself up. And it was kind of amazing because I could escape my life and my stuff and, and jump into this, this other creation and character. And I moved to LA the day after I turned 20 with $350 in my account in my Suzu Amigo because I had this dream in my heart to act. And I had no idea what I had coming, you know, what was, what was in the future and what was in my path. You see these A-list actors, you see these beautiful blonde girls with plastic surgery and on the outside they're perfect and so I'm like oh this is what this is what Hollywood is it's perfection and everybody's beautiful and perfect and running around and I had some a, a good two years of really scary <laughs> events that led me to hit rock bottom with drugs and men and partying that um, thankfully God did not take my life but I was close to it. So I had a year of being alone and some even scarier circumstances with somebody that I was dating and he was addicted to drugs and, and had a very close call to, to death for me. Um, and that's kind of was my wake up call. I was, I was like, okay, this is not working. I am, I am broken that the eating disorders had resurfaced. The, the person that I was dating was addicted to drugs and alcohol. I kind of was falling into, into that. And, um, 
I realized like this is not a good path multiple multiple signs and so so it kind of led me to my stoplight moment which is in my book about coming to God and and uh, crying out to God at a, at a stoplight and there happens to be a man stand uh, in his car beeping his horn and I'm covered in tears and, and crying out saying I am dying I, I have no will to live I don't I don't know what to do I don't have anybody to turn to I don't know anybody that can put me back on the right path or even speak hope and hope to me. So I cried out to God and there was a sweet little Mexican man pointing to the radio and it was literally a pastor. That's why I love radio so much because, um, you know, it, you could be in that moment. It's in a, it is my stoplight moment and, and God manifested in this man. And, and it was, uh, this radio station, I believe it was KKLA, which we listen, listen to now of, uh, words repeating back to me of basically what I had just cried out. And that was really God saying, I am here and I love you. And I have, a, I have a plan with the future and a hope. And so slowly, but surely my life started to turn around and I started to go to church and gave my life to the Lord. Thankfully, I, I slowly got on that path. It was another year of figuring it out. And, um, I was waiting tables and then I got certified as a personal trainer and so there happened to be some trainers that were also Christians and that and that helped. So I started going back to church. I started watching Joyce Meyer. I would get up before I would go go to work and and watch Joyce Meyer and I would and I, what I love about Joyce is her transparency and and I connect with her and my story because I'm just as broken as I as I was as a kid, but I'm now able to say, okay, I'm here to seek God every day. And I had no foundation of of what truth was. And so it was a, a slow process of listening to sermons, going to church, falling, <laughs> getting back up again. And um, I think I'm still there today. You know, every day I'm like, okay, Lord, here I am. I know I'm not going to be perfect. And your life's never going to look like you want it to look like, and you're never going to be perfect if you call yourself a Christian. And we are, um, we are all, you know, always on this this path to try to to grow closer to Him and hopefully let Him shine through more. Andrea is an advocate of bringing faith to others through film, through digital means, through books, and more. She and her husband David, through their company PureFlix, are doing just that every day. She believes books like Jesus Calling and her own book, Perfectly Unfinished, Finding Beauty in the Midst of Brokenness, help others to understand God in deeper ways. David started with a few other partners, and um, our few, first few films were DVD. So it was building a library of films that were straight to DVD, because at the time, um, the budgets were much smaller, and the whole goal was to get the investors money back. Obviously that's the goal for any film you do. Well, we didn't have access and resources to, to fund $25 million films. And so it was just the, the films that could, you know, produce DVDs and that spawned into a few years later doing starting pure Flix. We had our, our years of questioning like, okay, we know that you've given this burden on our heart to do films that glorify you but nothing's moving. <laughs> Nothing, you know, there's no fruit, Lord. Like, okay, the investors are getting their money back. The, the, the money, the DVDs are great. People are loving them. We're, we, we have this great audience. These fans are amazing, but we're not really making a living from it. And this was years of trying to figure this out. And, and thankfully God allowed one of our films called God's Not Dead, which was released in, I want to say March of 2000. 14. So not even three years ago. Um, that was our first big, we, we had done other theatricals with limited theatrical release, but that was our big theatrical release and, and basically put everything on the line. And it was either going to, we were going to lose everything or God was going to bless this film. Thankfully <laughs> God did, did the other. And he really, he blessed, he blessed the film. So it really was, not an overnight success. It was 20 plus years of David pounding the pavement, making films that made a little bit, you know, planted seeds. And, um, so I believe it's, it was God rewarding and I'm a byproduct, you know, I, I obviously was saved and 
want to glorify God in all things that I do. It's always uh, a work in progress. It's exciting to see where the business is is taking it because it is now um, mostly digital. For me and for my children, David and I are so aware of how much, <laughs> how much content and, and and media and that's out there that's not healthy for our eyes and our spirits. We want to give families and and people an alternative to one, hopefully lead them to hope, because I truly believe when when God's word and and faith filled uh, messages are there, they don't return void. We do this devotion with our kids every day. This is Jesus calling for kids. The devotions are my lifesaver because I'm always in my head and I'm always trying to figure out, okay, did God speak to me? Was that from God? But what I love about Sarah's um, work and the, the devotions is that it's one page, it's one or two scriptures, and it's a few paragraphs that I can take any mom, any wife, any person can open up to the date and focus on that. And it's so simple. And what I love for her, what I love the way that she has, has designed it is that it's so practical. I need practical. I feel like I have, I have ADD. I have such a, a filter of you're, you're doing it wrong. you you can't do it. And, and God's not attainable. And so for me, I'm like, I can connect with God by this scripture. Um, right here, I'm looking at one, the one who heals uh, in August, but it says, he forgives all my sins and heals all my di- all my diseases, Psalm 103.3. And it's literally just that scripture. Okay, I can focus on that. And that's funny, I open up to it because I've been dealing with chronic illness for, for um, actually since my second daughter was born. I might have these things screaming at me in my body and in my head, but I can have just this, just this scripture that I can focus on. Okay, God, I don't know what to do in this moment, but I have, you know, this scripture to focus on today. And it's really just little seeds of truth. And I love devotions because we, right now, to be honest, as a mom of three, I don't have time to be in the word for an hour. So it's been such a blessing to me. Thank you, Sarah Young, for <laughs> for doing that. Because even if it's a two-minute devotion, even if it's a 15-minute a, a program, whether it's a podcast, whether it's you know something on Pure Flix or TV or a film that we do that's in theaters, that's our hope is to kind of infiltrate other people's spirits with hope. The hope is is that the perfect one lives inside of you. He lives inside of all of you. And and I have to trust that my life is this crazy, beautiful mess. And I'm here for one thing. I'm here to serve God. I'm here to glorify him in my highs and in my lows, in my brokenness, in my sin. And I will never be who I think I should be. And so I just want other people and listeners to know that whether you have fallen from, you know, whether you're in an addiction, I I come from a family of addiction. So I was prone to addiction. Mine happened to be food and, and eating disorders. And, um, I believe the only thing that can heal any of us is the love of Christ. And, and that doesn't happen overnight. That, that has to be by allowing other people to love you. The book is called perfectly unfinished, finding beauty in the midst of brokenness. So it's really the my life story of tragedy, <laughs> a lot of tears, a lot of brokenness. Coming from being a perfectionist, I had to learn to surrender that I will never earn God's healing, God's love, and God's uh, and my salvation in my own strength. And and years of losing, you know, I, I lost a child, uh, I miscarried, I. We went. We had the years of Job building Pure Flex where we didn't get paid for two years, and so we had to start over. I mean, I can give you story after story where every nobody knows what anybody goes through unless we sh- share them. And I have this this uh, conviction on my heart because I am such a perfectionist to this day. You know, my car's a mess. I'm the poster child for being the most imperfect, unfinished, messed up. <laughs> person that just really wants to love God, you know, we're, we're all hurting and we all have this emptiness in our heart for only God to fill. And even now as a believer, 
and, and this social, the age of social media that we feel like, oh my gosh, we need to do this and be this person on social media and we need to promote this. And we get so lost in, in that. And, and God is really a simple God and, and we are created to serve him and to show others his love. To learn more about Andrea Logan White, visit andrealoganwhite.com. Her new book, Perfectly Unfinished, Finding Beauty in the Midst of Brokenness, is available wherever books are sold. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with author, teacher, and speaker Lisa Bevere. Lisa and her husband are the founders of Messenger International. Lisa is a grandmother who has written a new children's book called Lizzie the Lioness that teaches little ones what it means to be brave. I just think, you know, there's no creature that makes, you know, little boys and little girls feel fiercer than a lion, you know? And so like when you tell them you're as bold as a lion, they're like, I am as bold as a lion. So, you know, Proverbs 28, one, the righteous are as bold as a lion says to them, it's not your size. It's not your age. It's your standing with God that emboldens you to be a lion, to be as bold as a lion. The featured passage for this week comes from the February 29th entry of the Jesus Always audiobook. I called you out of darkness into my marvelous light. I brought you not only out of darkness, but into my royal family. I clothed you with my personal robe of righteousness, making you fit for my kingdom. You are one of my own special people. You belong to me, and I delight in you. I have chosen to use imperfect ones like you to proclaim my praises. I know you cannot do this as well as you would like. Actually, without my help, it is impossible for you to do. This gap between my call on your life and your ability to respond is part of my plan. It heightens your awareness of your utter insufficiency. Because you are mine, I allow you to connect your inability to my boundless sufficiency. Instead of focusing on your inadequacy, work on staying close to me. In everything you do, consciously rely on my help, living in the joyous wonder of self-forgetfulness. As you look to me for all you need, your face will reflect the light of my surpassing glory. Hear more great stories about the impact Jesus Calling is having all over the world. Be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling podcast on iTunes. We value your reviews and comments so we can reach even more people with the message of Jesus Calling. And if you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.